Here's an idea. Deadpool knows he's a comic book character because of his unique relationship with his own body. This episode of Idea Channel is brought to you by lynda.com. It's amazing what you can get away with when you think nobody's watching, and also what you give yourself permission to do when you know that you have an audience. And you would probably think that both of these states are mutually exclusive. And they are, for most people. But Deadpool isn't most people, and I think he'd be the first to tell you that, directly. At the heart of what makes Deadpool work as a character and work so well are some deeply complicated dualisms like this one, which I want to try to explore. But before we do, for the unfamiliar, some background. So before Deadpool, AKA Wade Wilson, was Ryan Reynolds, he was Cable's nemesis in an early 90s Marvel series created by Fabian Nicieza and Rob Liefeld. By the mid 90s, he had his own self-titled series. And by the late 90s, he was a fixture of the Marvel universe, having transitioned via several writers, most notably Joe Kelly, to a kind of slapstick anti-hero parody of the grim darkness found throughout comics. Today, it would be an understatement to say that he's a fan favorite. Oh, and by the way, we have a new set. We're gonna unveil the whole thing pretty soon. Anyway, his popularity may be a little surprising given that Deadpool has, at first glance at least, kind of a standard loadout of superhero abilities. He's got superhuman strength, agility, world-class combat skills, which essentially add up to the oh-so-distinctive characteristic of good at fighting, which is not exactly Eisner award-winning material. More notably, like fellow Canuck Wolverine, Deadpool is a product of the infamous Weapon X program, which means he has a healing factor that's based on Wolverine's, but in comparison, Deadpool's is exceptional. It keeps everything from injury and dismemberment to cancer from killing him. He just will not die. His most defining feature, though, isn't his substantial physical capability, but his wit. Nicknamed the Merc with the Mouth, Deadpool is a wise, kraken, guff-given, insult-hurling, red-clad source of constant commentary. However, Deadpool's quips aren't quite like, say, Hawkeye's, who has something to say about everything, but not everything, everything. By which I mean Deadpool knows, or according to who you ask, thinks he's a comic book character. Deadpool will often comment on the gutter between panels. He'll react to particularly gross onomatopoeia. He will reference and even sometimes directly address the nice people reading his book. Deadpool knows what his context is. He can sense somehow the complete frame of his own existence. This is Deadpool's definitive power. It's what makes Deadpool Deadpool. Arguably what allows him to put his other abilities to such effective use is this sense. And I wanna talk about how I think it works. Specifically, I think in addition to being a physical and mental adept, Deadpool is also a phenomenological one. Phenomenology is a branch of philosophy concerned with describing human experience, specifically in relationship to perception and the existence of the world. It's all about how the world around us is a result of our sensations, not the other way around. Phenomenology is the domain of many well-known thinkers, but 20th century French philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty is who we're gonna draw from the most, specifically his book, Phenomenology of Perception. Phenomenology posits that reality is comprised of phenomena, events and objects that are perceived by people. Everything we perceive is organized into what Merleau-Ponty sometimes calls the text of reality by our consciousness via experience. But okay, what counts as experience? First, there's our senses, the big five, but it doesn't stop there. Thinking and imagining are also experiences. Emotions too. Desiring something is an experience that you have of that thing. Memories, sentiment, literal and emotional feeling, making meaning with language. You know, experience. The sum total of all of our possible senses, perceptions, and experiences directed at and responding to phenomena in the world comprise reality. This is our phenomenological frame. You can also think of it kind of like sonar. Metaphysically, the world is a very dark place and our consciousness sends out and receives back various modes of perception which construct the lay of the land from the darkness, give it meaning. So what we're gonna try to do is explain how Deadpool's perceived reality is different because his experiences and therefore consciousness are also different. 
To start down that road though, we gotta believe, or at least perform the belief, that he possesses perceptions and a consciousness in his own world. I think he does, and I think we treat most fictional characters as though they do. If you don't wanna attribute agency and consciousness to fictional characters, then talking about how and why Deadpool is the way he is becomes really simple. The reasons are textual. He's a smartass because Rob Liefeld thought it would be funny. Deadpool has three separate inner voices because it is tons of work for the staff to write and draw a whole other character, so Deadpool becomes his own fractured straight man. In this explanation, Deadpool knows he's fictional because the comic itself is meta and made by clever people. Done. Who wants chimichangas? Ooh, me, I do. Oh, hey Scott from NerdSync. I am actually now just realizing I only have the one chimichanga and I haven't had dinner yet. Well, that's a bummer. Guess I could just talk more about Deadpool's inner voices since they do have an interesting history behind them. Deadpool debuted in New Mutants number 98 from 1991 where he didn't even have so much as one inner voice, let alone two. It wasn't until nearly two decades later in Wolverine Origins number 21 that writer Daniel Way decided to give Deadpool those distinct and often argumentative voices in his head. Deadpool had his main inner voice and is now trademark pale yellow boxes, but the second one was designed more like a torn piece of paper ripped straight from his mental diary. The the dynamic between all three of Deadpool's voices, spoken, thought, and, uh, journaled? I guess, was a hit with the fans, which was great news since Deadpool's appearance in Wolverine's comic acted as a kind of backdoor pilot for a new series that Way was planning for the character. This allowed Way to launch his famous run on Deadpool, which lasted four years and spawned many memes that you've probably seen around the internet. In this new series, the design of the two inner voices were standardized the way that most of us would likely recognize them today. Initially, they were supposed to represent what Deadpool was really thinking and what he wanted you to think he was thinking. Over time, however, the voices started to take on attributes coinciding with Freud's model of personality. The yellow box is the id, Deadpool's speaking voice is the ego, and the white boxes are the super ego. And the balance between them is what makes Deadpool Deadpool. This is what we're talking about over on my channel, NerdSync. So come on over and check it out. Desperate for attention, are we? Give me some slack, man. This YouTube sub is hard. Sub for sub. No, 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 no. Hey. Oh, sorry, sorry. Hey, thanks, Scott. Yeah, that's really interesting. Everybody, make sure to go check out Scott's video at the end of this one. But yeah, just as Deadpool's authors have had different ideas of what those text boxes represent, fans have had ideas about what exactly Deadpool must be going through in fiction explanations of his meta, yellow box aware quirks and capabilities. The most compelling, I think, is that Deadpool should have died hundreds, if not thousands of times from both sickness and injury, but his healing factor is always bringing him back from the brink. Deadpool is in constant pain, always feeling, always aware of his body and its torment, which never ceases. Also, if I'm not gonna eat dinner, let's finish this theory back in the corner. This theory posits that a potential side effect of that torment is a kind of brain damage. And a symptom of this brain damage, delusions. That he is, in fact, a comic book character. This would mean that Deadpool isn't just a meta-comic, but a comic about someone with a very intense and unique experience of their world, a very unique phenomenological frame, due in no small part to his physical state. We perceive and sense things with, and because we have, a body made of, like, meat and nerve endings, and however it comes about, a self. This distinction between the mind and the body is probably really familiar. Vessel versus soul, corpus versus consciousness, etc. Mind-body dualism says that there is stuff, including the, you know, body, and then there's immaterial spirit, including the mind, which is us. We are our spirit. Cartesian dualism specifically holds that while the mind and body may interact, things which exist are either stuff or spirit, thing or consciousness, and that in order to know about the existence of stuff, we must rely on our own internal subjective existence. That is the seat of both self and knowledge. Your mind knows things, but your body doesn't. So our man Merleau-Ponty said that this is a bunch of hokum. He spent no shortage of time trying to adequately explain this idea. So our defense in this video is, you know, abbreviated. But basically he says that the human body, if it is an object, stuff in the Cartesian sense, is considered and treated unlike 
any other object. When you move your hand, you don't move your hand like you move a coffee mug. You move some complicated internal sense of your own hand. Merleau-Ponty wrote that one does not move their objective body, they move their phenomenal body. The parts and processes of bodies, yours and others, can't be separated from the experience of, you know, having one. And consciousness, he said, is not pure thought separate from having a body. There's no consciousness without sense, and there's no sense without meat. Even more cerebral experiences like thinking, imagining, desiring, and dreaming are totally bound up in the physical. Merleau-Ponty wrote, I am my body, and reciprocally my body is something like a natural subject or provisional sketch of my total being. Instead of the self and knowledge being wholly interior, Merleau-Ponty thought we know and understand the world because of our embodied experience of it. My body is that by which there are objects, he wrote. So, I mean, what if your embodied sense is extraordinary? What if you are always feeling your body, hyper aware of exactly what's happening to it, as Deadpool is? What if because of your healing factor, you can think of and interact with parts of your own body as though they were objects, and so develop a sense of them the way that you have a sense of things? Phenomenologically, at least, it stands to reason that this would fundamentally alter your knowledge and perception of the world. And I mean, let's review. Deadpool perceives the space between panels on a page. He knows about the weird sounds made as he's stabbed through the gut. He references, interacts with, and understands thought bubbles. Knows that typefaces, coloring, issues, and series endings are a part of his reality. In short, he knows that his reality is, literally and phenomenologically, a text which he is interpreting, assembling, constituting by his particular experience of it. He's always aware of how his body is working, what it's doing, how it's reacting, sensing, and feeling. He's always in dialogue, often literally, with it. So of course, in a grander sense, he would be in dialogue, often literally, with his reality. Incidentally, this also really makes me wonder if this has an effect on what it's like to be a Deadpool cosplayer. I've interacted with more than a few at cons here and there. What's up, Phoenix? And they always remind me of something that Deadpool's creator said when he was first created, that since they couldn't imagine his book wouldn't get canceled, they kind of just let him do what he wanted. They figured no one was looking, and when the higher-ups would eventually notice this weird madcap merc with a mouth, they'd be all, well, that is certainly enough of that, and just can the book. So they kind of just let him loose. How is that for poetic? A character who became notable for his canonized knowledge that everyone is watching, given free reign because, hey, no one's looking. I can't imagine that this doesn't perfectly explain what it must be like to be Deadpool, both actually and performatively as a cosplayer. To sit in that weird limbo between dance like you're alone in your bedroom and ham it up because everyone's watching, you might as well give them a good show. Where Jean-Paul Sartre said that hell is other people because you can't help but imagine yourself in their gaze. By the mere appearance of the other, I am put in a position of passing judgment on myself as on an object. Merleau-Ponty thought that the gaze of others was an integral part of one's experience of the world. He wrote, you are literally what other people think of you. And Deadpool, unlike pretty much every other comic book character, knows it. Or, depending upon who you ask, thinks it's the case. What do you guys think? Is Deadpool's reality different from everyone else's because of his relationship to his own body? Let us know in the comments and I will respond to some of them in next week's comment response video. Special thanks to Scott from NerdSync. If you haven't checked out his video on Deadpool this week, go and do that right now. And while you're there, of course, click all of the buttons. Actually click subscribe and like, and then the post underneath the comment. Those are the good buttons. To, I mean, actually, yeah, click every button. They're, they're all helpful. Except if you've already subscribed, this is getting out of hand. In this week's comment response video, we talk about the Fallout universe and the transistor as a symbol of peace. If you want to watch that one, you can click right here or find a link in the doobly-doo. One small bit of news, I was recently on an episode of Flash Forward, which is a podcast that my friend Rose makes about distant futures. Uh, and the one that I am in, I play uh, a guest voice. I'm someone who's advertising for sex bot storage solutions. So the episode is all about sex bots and a future where those things are common. So if that, Tickles your fancy, we'll put a link to that in the description.
In case you missed it, we uploaded the dramatic readings of the t-shirt winnings short stories on Friday. Uh, we'll put a link, you know, somewhere so you can watch those, which you should. They're, they're very good. They're very good. And I can say that because I didn't write them. We have a Facebook and IRC and a subreddit links to those in the doobly-doo. The tweet of the week this week comes from Victor Rocco, who asks whether or not the last episode of Idea Channel was claiming that Fallout is in some way Adam Punk, which is a thing that I had never heard of and had not considered. And I think we're going to end up talking about this in the comment response videos this week. So I don't want to um, over uh, pose this question here, but I think it's a really good one and a really interesting one. So I'm curious if you have any reactions about the idea of Fallout being Adam Punk. And hey, in case you were wondering, this episode of Idea Channel is sponsored by lynda.com. lynda.com has thousands of courses on topics like web development, photography, and visual design. Courses are taught by experts and new courses are always being added. You want to find a new job or just sharpen your skills? Click on the link in the description below or visit lynda.com forward slash idea and start your trial today. And last but certainly not least, this week's episode would not have been possible without the hard work of these various production position titles with mouths. Just kidding, they all provide the perfect amount of commentary consistently.